The Quran, The Great War, and the West by Imran and Hussein. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prophesized the great war that would be fought between two warring parties, both belonging to the same religious calling. حدثنا أبو هريرة عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وذكر أحاديث منها وقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لا تقوم الساعة حتى تقتتل فئتان عظيمتان وتكون بينهما مقتلة عظيمة ودعواهما واحدة أبو هريرة reported many أحاديث from Allah's messenger And one of them was this, the last hour will not come until the two warring parties confront each other and there is a large-scale massacre amongst them and they both belong to the same religious calling. Sahih al-Bukhari We direct attention to what should be recognized as an indisputable fact, namely that the great war that will soon occur would be fought primarily so by two opposing forces that are both Christian. Our critics, of course, will differ with us. They always do so. Russia, which leads one side in the coming war, is an orthodox Christian country, which has only recently successfully extricated itself from the venomous embrace of a virulently atheist Soviet Union. The United States of America, which now leads a rival Western Christian camp, that has constantly waged war on Christian Russia for centuries and now lusts for another such war is also a largely Christian country adhering to Western Christianity rather than Orthodox Christianity. How do these two Christian groups differ with each other? There are important differences between the two opposing Christian camps and it is a matter of great importance indeed for those who seek guidance on this subject from the Qur'an, that we investigate and recognize the differences that exist between the two opposing Christian camps. This is so because the Qur'an has made a very important distinction between two different kinds of Christians. According to the Qur'an, there would be Christians who would be closest in love and affection for Muslims. Surah Al-Ma'idah Chapter 5, verse 82, such Christians would emerge, not just at the time when the Qur'an was revealed, but also in time to come. Indeed, the Christian king of Abyssinia in Africa did show love and affection for Muslims who were slaves and semi-slaves in pagan Mecca and who had fled persecution and war on Islam to seek asylum in Abyssinia. The king refused Makkah's request for extradition of their slaves and semi-slaves and assured the Muslims that they could live in peace and security in Christian Abyssinia for as long as they wished. He also showed great respect for Islam while making favorable comments concerning the religion of Islam. When news reached him that the Christian king had died in Abyssinia, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam performed funeral prayers for him in Yathrib, now called Medina to Nabi. But the Qur'an also recognized other Christians, different from those mentioned above, who would one day reconcile with Jews and establish friendship and alliance with them. It not only prohibited Muslims from being friends and allies of such Christians who establish friendship and alliance with Jews, i.e. a Judeo-Christian alliance, but went on to declare that such Muslims would be recognized to have become a part of that Judeo-Christian alliance and to have thus lost their religious identity as Muslims. Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter 5, verse 51. Thus, when the angels come to question them in their graves, they will find to their astonishment and dismay that their claim to be Muslims will be rejected and they will be judged together with and as a part of their friends and allies in the Judeo-Christian alliance.
Let us now attempt to describe the differences which exist between the two Christian camps which are now taking the world to nuclear war. The Orthodox Christians do not want war with the West and have never waged war on Western Christians, but the Orthodox Christians have made it abundantly clear that they are not afraid of war, not even if it be nuclear war. It is the Western camp which has waged endless wars on Orthodox Christian Russia and now lusts for war with the Orthodox Christians and the West has always waged war with deception and with a mountain of lies. The most important of the differences or distinctions which separate these two Christian peoples is their relationship with Jews and with the Jewish Zionist movement. While Western Christianity has reconciled with Judaism over the Jewish rejection of Jesus السلام, as the Messiah and the Jewish role in demanding his crucifixion and has moved on to establish a Judeo-Christian Zionist alliance which offers carte blanche support to the state of Israel, the Orthodox Christian world has not moved in that direction and instead contests the exclusive Jewish claim to Jerusalem. Almost the entire Orthodox Christian world opposed the decision of USA to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Here is the text of the letter addressed by the heads of all such Christian churches in Jerusalem to US President Donald Trump. It was written to protest the US decision to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of the state of Israel. Patriarchs and heads of local churches in Jerusalem, President Donald J. Trump, President of the United States of America, Jerusalem, December 6, 2017. Dear Mr. President, we are fully aware and appreciative of how you are dedicating special attention to the status of Jerusalem in these days. We are following with attentiveness and we see that it is our duty to address this letter to your excellency. On July 17th, 2000, we addressed a similar letter to the leaders who met in Camp David to decide the status of Jerusalem. They kindly took our letter into consideration. Today, Mr. President, we are confident that you too will take our viewpoint into consideration on the very important status of Jerusalem. Our land is called to be a land of peace. Jerusalem, the city of God, is a city of peace for us and for the world. Unfortunately though, our holy land with Jerusalem, the holy city, is today a land of conflict. Those who love Jerusalem have every will to work and make it a land and a city of peace, life and dignity for all its inhabitants. The prayers of all believers in it, the three religions and two peoples who belong to this city, rise to God and ask for peace. As the psalmist says, return to us God Almighty, look down from heaven and see, inspire our leaders, and fill their minds and hearts with justice and peace. Mr. President, we have been following with concern the reports about the possibility of changing how the United States understands and deals with the status of Jerusalem. We are certain that such steps will yield increased hatred, conflict, violence, and suffering in Jerusalem and the Holy Land, moving us farther from the goal of unity and deeper toward destructive division. We ask from you, Mr. President, to help us all walk towards more love and a definitive peace, which cannot be reached without Jerusalem being for all. Our solemn advice and plea is for the United States to continue recognizing the present international status of Jerusalem. Any sudden changes would cause irreparable harm. We are confident that, with strong support from our friends, Israelis and Palestinians can work towards negotiating a sustainable and just peace, 
benefiting all who long for the holy city of Jerusalem to fulfill its destiny. The holy city can be shared and fully enjoyed once a political process helps liberate the hearts of all people that live within it from the conditions of conflict and destructiveness that they are experiencing. Christmas is upon us soon. It is a feast of peace. The angels have sung in our sky. Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to the people of goodwill. In this coming Christmas, we plea for Jerusalem not to be deprived from peace. We ask you, Mr. President, to help us listen to the song of the angels. As the Christian leaders of Jerusalem, we invite you to walk with us in hope as we build a just, inclusive peace for all the peoples of this unique and holy city. With our best regards and best wishes for a Merry Christmas, patriarchs and heads of churches in Jerusalem. The only Orthodox Christians who did not oppose the American decision were those who had joined NATO. Another important distinction between the two camps is the adoption by the Western camp of moral, social and legal acceptance of a feminist revolution which the Orthodox Christian world rejects with vehemence. Western Christians constantly advance a feminist agenda which makes it legal for a man to marry another man and get a marriage certificate. They also prohibit marriage before the age of 18 while considering premarital sex and the consequent loss of virginity prior to marriage to be but a natural stage of the process of growing up. The Orthodox Christians, on the other hand, defiantly reject the homosexual agenda of their Western rivals and consider it to be the most visible sign of Western blasphemy against the Lord God. The terminology in Islam for this blasphemy is kufr. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam warned that the word kafir, disbeliever, would be written on the forehead of the Antichrist. While the Western Christian camp that is led by USA has an arrogant agenda of seeking to impose full-spectrum dominance, political, economic, monetary, military, etc., on all of mankind, the present Orthodox Christian world that is led by Russia has no such imperial agenda. It is of course true that while Russia was under the control of some of the Tsars, it was definitely an imperialist power which waged unjust wars against Muslims, but this is not true for Russia today. Western Christianity has embraced secularism, in consequence of which religion no longer constitutes the primary identity of the Western Christian. Rather, religious identity has now been replaced by national identity. The Orthodox Christian world has not been so secularized and, as a consequence, the primary identity of Orthodox Christians remains their Christian faith. The Orthodox Christian world has maintained religion as the most important social institution in their civilization. And as a consequence, the priesthood and monasticism still play very important roles in Orthodox Christianity. Religion and the religious way of life are fast disappearing as an important institution in Western Christian civilization. Monasticism has largely disappeared in Western Christianity, with churches and monasteries being increasingly sold to McDonald hamburgers, etc., or to Muslims to be converted to masajid or Islamic schools. The evidence is startlingly clear that the Qur'an was referring to the Orthodox Christian world when it declared that there would be Christians who would be closest in love and affection to Muslims, and it was referring to Western Christianity when it prohibited Muslims from maintaining friendship and alliance with certain Christians and Jews. Those who obstinately reject the above explanation of the Qur'an as false and cannot offer another explanation to replace what is presented above have a status of nuisance and should be ignored. 
a history of centuries of rivalry and warfare. The rivalry between these two camps is not a recent phenomenon, but rather has existed for centuries and became most visible when Western Christianity launched the Crusades or Holy Wars for recovering Jerusalem from Muslim rule. The Crusaders launched an attack on Constantinople, which was the capital city of the Orthodox Christian world, and conquered it in the Fourth Crusade. They ruled over it for several decades before the Orthodox Christians were able to defeat them and liberate their capital city. The extent of rejection of Western Christianity and bitterness against that West in the hearts of Orthodox Christians was most dramatically visible when Constantinople was besieged by the Ottoman so-called Islamic Empire and in mortal danger of falling to the Muslims. The Orthodox Christians turned in desperation to the West for help. The Vatican responded with a condition for Western military intervention that could save Constantinople. The condition was that they should give up their Orthodox Christian faith and join the West religiously. The response of the Orthodox Christian world still remains to this day written in gold. Better the turban of the Muslim than the hat of the Cardinal. Orthodox Christianity chose to accept defeat at the hands of the Ottoman Empire rather than avoid such defeat by accepting the terms that Western Christianity offered to intervene militarily to assist the Orthodox Christian world. There is quite some evidence that Western Christianity cooperated and collaborated with the Ottoman Empire in their rivalry with the Orthodox Christian world. Not only did the Ottoman Empire conquer Constantinople and deprive the Orthodox Christian world of their capital city, but also to add salt to the wound. The Ottomans seized the greatest cathedral of the Orthodox Christian world, Hagia Sophia, and sinfully converted it to a masjid in manifest violation of the clear obligation imposed in the Qur'an requiring Muslims to protect such houses of God. The Ottomans waged endless wars against the Orthodox Christians until they succeeded in taking control of Crimea and in this depriving Orthodox Christian Russia of a military presence in the Black Sea. Not only was Orthodox Christian Russia attacked by the West as well as by the Ottoman Empire, but pro-Western Tsars who ruled over Russia did everything that they could to turn Russia away from Orthodox Christianity and towards the West. They also deliberately targeted Muslims while launching grand wars of imperial expansion. Heroic Muslim resistance to such Tsarist Russian imperialism still lingers in the memories of Muslims who were subjected to barbaric Tsarist Russian oppression and helps to fan, to this day, the flames of hatred for Russia. Muslims seem to have never understood that Orthodox Christian Russia should not be blamed for the sins of the Tsars who were installed over Russia by Russia's greatest enemy. It was precisely because those Tsars advanced the interests of Western Christianity rather than that of Orthodox Christian Russia that they are known in the West as great. The most conspicuous of all such Tsars are Peter the Great and Catherine the Great. When Orthodox Christian Russia succeeded in defeating the Ottomans and in seizing control of Crimea, the Christian West then waged the Crimean War of 1852-1855 to 1855 to successfully deprive Russia of military control over Crimea and a military presence in the Black Sea. That victory of the Christian West in depriving Russia of a military presence in Crimea was short-lived since Russia succeeded in just a few years in overturning the ban imposed by the West in consequence of their victory in the Crimean War.
the most spectacular success that the West ever achieved in its centuries-long attacks on Russia and, by implication, the Orthodox Christian world, was the successful Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, which brought such regime change to Russia as replaced the rule of Tsar Nicholas that was committed to the preservation and advancement of the Christian faith with an atheist, communist state which not only destroyed the free and fair market in the Orthodox Christian world, but also waged merciless war on the Orthodox Christian faith and church. Even after Germany had surrendered and the Second World War was essentially over, the West allowed the Soviet Union to continue the war until it could take military control of that part of the Orthodox Christian world which had not as yet been conquered. It was certainly not by accident that the Soviet Union also took Crimea away from Russia in 1954 and handed over in the middle of the night to Ukraine. Rather, it was a continuation of the centuries-long endless wars of the West against Orthodox Christian Russia. When Russia again successfully reclaimed Crimea in early 2014, as its own territory and restored its military presence over the Black Sea, the implication was that yet another Western Christian war on Orthodox Christian Russia became inevitable. It is that war which is the subject of this essay. The coming great war to be waged against Russia, and by implication the Orthodox Christian world, forms part of a hostile military and religious profile which has persisted in Western Christianity ever since Rome parted from Constantinople more than a thousand years ago. However, this coming great war is different from all previous wars since it will be, without question, the greatest war ever fought in human history. It also threatens to be the final war since the nuclear weapons that will be used, as well as other such weapons of mass destruction, have the potential to destroy both sides of the war. Russian President Vladimir Putin warned the Western Christian world with these ominous words, Don't mess with nuclear Russia. We therefore know beyond doubt that Russia will not hesitate to respond to any Western Christian military attack on Russia or on Russia's ally, Syria, with a nuclear response. This will be so, even though Russia knows that nuclear war will devastate both sides in the war. In fact, Russia will have no option other than to respond with nuclear weapons to an attack launched by the Christian West. This is so because it is almost certain that the Western Christian strategy would be to seek to cripple Russia with a massive first strike while using a large number of nuclear weapons. One can already anticipate that Russia would be ready for that first strike and would respond with a massive nuclear response even before the Western nuclear bombs could reach Russian territory and military bases. The coming Great War would thus be a unique war in military history. It is in this context that we turn to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who has prophesied that precisely such a unique war would occur. The Prophet and the Great War Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prophesied that a great war will occur in which 99% of all combatants will be killed. This would be a unique war, since there has never been a war in history in which 99% of combatants were killed. What is very strange about this war is that it will be fought even though all those who fight would do so with the knowledge that very few would survive the war. This is clear from the prophecy of the Blessed Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that each of the combatants would say we would be the ones who would survive. It should not be difficult for readers to recognize that such a war would have to be 
fought using weapons of mass destruction such as nuclear and thermonuclear never before used in warfare. The great war that is coming would be precisely such a war since that war is now so close that it can occur at any time, it is fair for our readers to ask, why has the mountain of gold not as yet emerged from under the river? The prophet disclosed that the great war would be fought because the river Euphrates would uncover a mountain of gold, and the war would be fought for that gold. However, he advised the believers that they should not touch that gold. It should be clear to those who have even an elementary capacity to think that the great war would not be fought unless and until the river has uncovered that mountain of gold. A divine prophecy in the Quran of victory for those who follow Jesus salam and over those who reject him and commit kufr, disbelief. The Qur'an has prophesied the outcome of this great war between two Christian people, one of whom struggles to faithfully follow Christianity and the other with a profile of kufr or essential rejection of Christianity. Here is the verse of the Qur'an which has dramatically disclosed such an event concerning the followers of Jesus salam, that must occur before the end of history. إِذْ قَالَ اللَّهُ يَا عِيسَىٰ إِنِّي مُتَوَفِّيكَ وَرَافِعُكَ إِلَيَّ وَمُطَهِّرُكَ مِنَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَجَاعِلُ الَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوكَ فَوْقَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ ثُمَّ إِلَيَّ مَرْجِعُكُمْ فَأَحْكُمُ بَيْنَكُمْ فِي مَا كُنْتُمْ فِيهِ تَخْتَلِفُونَ فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا فَأُعَذِّبُهُمْ عَذَابًا شَدِيدًا فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ وَمَا لَهُمْ مِنْ نَاصِرِينَ وَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ فَيُوَفِّيهِمْ أُجُورَهُمْ وَاللَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ الظَّالِمِينَ Lo, God said, O Jesus, verily I shall take your soul and shall raise you unto me and cleanse you of those who commit kufr, disbelief. And I shall place those who follow you above those who commit kufr unto the day of resurrection. In the end, unto me you all must return, and I shall judge between you in matters wherein you differ. And as for those who are bent on denying the truth, I shall cause them to suffer a suffering severe in this world and in the life to come, and they shall have none to succor them. Whereas unto those who attain to faith and do good works, he will grant their reward in full, for God does not love evildoers. Surah Ali Imran, chapter 3, verses 55 to 57. The above passage of the Quran has not disclosed a divine declaration in support of those who follow Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, since they are not followers of Jesus alayhi salam. Rather, it has disclosed a prophecy pertaining to those to whom Jesus السلام, was sent. Who are they? إِلَىٰ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيل. Jesus السلام, was sent to Bani Israel, i.e. the Israelite people. Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse 49. وَإِذْ قَالَ عِيسَى بْنُ مَرْيَمَ يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ When Jesus the son of Mary said, O Israelite people, behold, I am a messenger of Allah unto you. Surah Al-Saf, chapter 61, verse 6. The Qur'an has established quite clearly in the above verses that Jesus السلام, was sent to the Israelite people. Hence, it is they who are required to follow him and not the followers of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The divine prophecy quoted above, Surah Ali Imran, chapter 3 verses 55 to 57, has therefore delivered news of an event that will occur amongst those to whom Jesus alayhi salam was sent, i.e. the Israelites, who are also known as Ahlul Kitab. Allah Most High has declared that 
history cannot end without such divine intervention of assistance to those who accept Jesus alayhi salam and who faithfully follow him that they will overcome and subjugate those who commit kufr or disbelief in relation to Jesus alayhi salam and the truth which he brought. We recognize first of all that when the verse referred to those who follow Jesus alayhi salam it would have to be those who accept him as the Messiah and that is the Christian world. Those on the other hand who are referred to in the verse as a people who commit kufr, disbelief, would have to be those who reject Jesus alayhi salam as the Messiah and continue to do so to this day and that is the Jewish world. Hence this prophecy in the Quran has informed us that Christians would eventually prevail over and subjugate Jews and therefore the Jewish state of Israel before history can end. This prophecy cannot therefore include amongst the ranks of Christians who follow Jesus alayhi salam a Western Christian world which is now the greatest supporter of the Jews and the Jewish state of Israel. We are therefore left with an implication from the verse that the Christians referred to would have to be the Orthodox Christian world which is led by Russia. In addition, Western Christianity is in a state of overt kufr as they promote their evil agenda for a man to marry another man and receive a legally valid marriage certificate. Such Christians will now be included with those, the Jews, who reject Jesus as the Messiah. It is they who will be defeated and subjugated by the true followers of Jesus alayhi salam before history can end. The Qur'an has declared that Rum will twice be victorious. The Qur'an attaches such importance to a people called Rum that a chapter of the book is named after them, Surah Al-Rum. Rum has to be a state with an army since the Qur'an confirmed that Rum was defeated in a land close by. But the Qur'an went on to prophesy, dramatically so, that Rum would change defeat into victory within just a few years. Alif Lam Mim Ghulibati Rum Fi Adn Al Ardi Wahum Mim Badi Ghalabihim Sayaghlibun Fi Bidi Sinin Lillahi Al Amru Min Qabul Wa Mim Bad Wa Yawma Idin Yafrahu Al Mu'minun Binasur Allah Yansur Man Yasha وهو العزيز الرحيم وعد الله لا يخلف الله وعده ولكن أكثر الناس لا يعلمون يعلمون ظاهرا من الحياة الدنيا وهم عن الآخرة هم غافلون ألف لام ميم Rum was defeated in a land located close by yet notwithstanding this defeat which they have experienced they will soon be victorious with victory coming within just a few years. Victory will take place twice in consequence of Allah's command, both previously as well as to come. And on that day when Rum is victorious, the believers will rejoice in Allah's assistance through which he delivered victory. He helps in this way whomever he chooses to help, since he alone is almighty and kind. Let the world take notice of Allah's promise of victory for room on two occasions and remember that Allah never fails to fulfill his promise but most people know it not rather they have knowledge of only the contemporary external phenomena of the life of this world whereas they are ignorant of the events that will occur at the end i.e. in the end time Surah al rum chapter 30 verses 1 to 7 when the Qur'an referred above to Rum, it had to be the Byzantine Christian Empire which was based in Constantinople, which was defeated in Syria by the Persian Zoroastrian Empire and that the prophecy of the Qur'an was fulfilled when they defeated the Persians within a few years. Muhammad Asad, the commentator of the Qur'an, 
has commented on the defeat and subsequent victory of Rum as follows. The defeats and victories spoken of above relate to the last phases of the centuries-long struggle between the Byzantine and Persian empires. During the early years of the 7th century, the Persians conquered parts of Syria and Anatolia. The lands close by, i.e. near the heartland of the Byzantine Empire. In 613 they took Damascus, and in 614 Jerusalem. Egypt fell to them in 615 to 616, and at the same time they laid siege to Constantinople itself. At the time of the revelation of this surah, about the seventh year before the Hijra, corresponding to 615 or 616 of the Christian era, the total destruction of the Byzantine Empire seemed imminent. The few Muslims around the Prophet were despondent on hearing the news of the utter discomfiture of the Byzantines, who were Christians and, as such, believed in the one God. The pagan Quraysh, on the other hand, sympathized with the Persians, who they thought would vindicate their own opposition to the one God idea. When Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam enunciated the above Qur'an verses, predicting a Byzantine victory within a few years, this prophecy was received with derision by the Quraysh. Now the term bid, commonly rendered as a few, denotes any number between three and ten. And as it happened, in 622, i.e. six or seven years after the Qur'anic prediction, the tide turned in favour of the Byzantines. In that year, Emperor Heraclius succeeded in defeating the Persians at Issus, south of the Taurus Mountains, and subsequently drove them out of Asia Minor. By 624, he carried the war into Persian territory and thus put the enemy on the defensive. And in the beginning of December 626, the Persian armies were completely routed by the Byzantines. If Rome is to be victorious in the end, i.e. the end time, and that victory is to come in consequence of Allah's help, we must seek to determine which Christians will deserve Allah's help and would consequently be victorious. The Byzantine Empire formally split into two parts in 1054, with one part based in Constantinople and the other based in Rome. Hence, there are now two Christian worlds, one East and the other West. Modern Western civilization has emerged from Rome of the West, and it is that civilization which has betrayed Jesus salam, to such an extent that they now advance the agenda for a man to marry another man and get a marriage certificate. We conclude that Allah's promise of help and victory, Surah al rum chapter 31, verses 1 to 7, Surah al Imran, chapter 3, verse 55, will apply to the Orthodox Christians who are led by Orthodox Christian Russia. Hence, Russia will emerge victorious in the Great War, which will soon occur. This conclusion finds further support in the prophecy of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the conquest of Constantinople by a Muslim army will occur after the Great War. In other words, the outcome of the Great War will make that conquest of Constantinople possible. Hence, it is not difficult to anticipate that NATO will be defeated in the Great War. Implications and Consequences of the Great War Islamic eschatology allows us to look forward to continuity of life on at least part of the earth after the Great War. Not only would a Muslim army conquer Constantinople after the Great War and break the stranglehold that the West had over the Bosphorus ever since the Ottoman Empire conquered Constantinople on May 29th, 1453. But the Antichrist would also appear in material form after the conquest of that city to rule over the state of Israel with the bogus claim to be the true Messiah. 
While this essay does not provide an Islamic eschatological description of events that will occur subsequent to the conquest of Constantinople, we can anticipate that such a conquest of that city would make it possible for the true world of Islam, which is faithful to the Qur'an, to return the cathedral of Hagia Sophia to the Orthodox Christian world. Indeed, the return to the Orthodox Christian world of that cathedral, which was shamefully, disgracefully and sinfully converted to a masjid by the conquering Ottoman Sultan Muhammad Fatih, would seal an alliance between the community of true followers of Jesus السلام, with the community of true followers of Prophet Muhammad It would be at that time that a strategically important prophecy in the Qur'an would be fulfilled and there would be nothing that the deaf, dumb and blind die-hard supporters of the imperial Ottoman so-called Islamic State can do to prevent it. Allah Most High has declared that in time to come a Christian people would be closest in love and affection to Muslims and this essay concludes that the Orthodox Christian world would fulfill that prophecy in the Qur'an despite all the efforts made by that Ottoman Empire over a period of almost 600 years to sabotage that end-time friendship and alliance between these two religious communities. Here is the prophecy in the Qur'an. لَتَجِدَنَّ أَشَدَّ النَّاسِ عَدَاوَةً لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الْيَهُودَ وَالَّذِينَ أَشْرَكُوا وَلَتَجِدَنَّ أَقَرَبَهُمْ مَوَدَّةً لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّا نَصَارًا ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّ مِنْهُمْ قِسِّيسِينَ وَرُهْبَانًا وَأَنَّهُمْ لَا يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ You will surely find that of all people the most hostile to those who believe in this divine writ are the Jews as well as those who blaspheme against the Lord God. And you will surely find that, of all people, they who say, Behold, we are Christians, come closest to feeling love and affection for those who believe in this divine writ. This is so because there are priests and monks among them, and because they are not arrogant. Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter 5, verse 82 verses of hope and a prayer for protection and relief. The Qur'an has provided for the believers a prayer which they should recite for protection and relief at the time of the Great War. رَبَّنَا اكْشِفْ عَنَّا الْعَذَابَ إِنَّا مُؤْمِنُونَ O oh, our Lord God, kindly relieve us of this terrible torment, for we are indeed a people who have faith in you. Surah Al-Dukhan, chapter 44 Verse 12, it has also provided verses which deliver hope to the hearts of the believers so that they be not gripped with fear and fall into a state of despair. الَّذِينَ قَالَ لَهُمُ النَّاسُ إِنَّ النَّاسَ قَدْ جَمَعُوا لَكُمْ فَخْشَوْهُمْ فَزَادَهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَقَالُوا حَسْبُنَ اللَّهُ وَنِعْمَ الْوَكِيلُ Those unto whom men said, Lo, the people have gathered against you, therefore fear them. The threat of danger but increased the faith of them and they cried Allah is sufficient for us excellent is he in whom we trust Surah Ali Imran chapter 3 verse 173 so they returned with grace and favor from Allah and no harm touched them. They followed the good pleasure of Allah, and Allah is of infinite bounty. Surah Ali Imran, chapter 3, verse 174. It is only the devil who would make men fear his partisans. Fear them not. Fear me, if you are true believers. Surah Ali Imran, chapter 3. Verse 175